I'm Brian May in the Cal OES Newsroom. Over the past several days, the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services has received requests from the state of Texas and FEMA officials to activate some of our state and national urban search and rescue task force teams. Those teams are now responding in support of emergency operations related to Hurricane Harvey up and down the Texas Gulf Coast. We realize some of you may have questions as to how those requests come in and what our California USAR teams will be doing while deployed in Texas. So this afternoon, we had a chance to sit down with Mark Gilarducci, the director of Cal OES, and ask him exactly how this is playing out. Mark, I know you're, you're busy. I want to appreciate uh, your time with us this afternoon. I want to ask you some of the questions that we've been getting in our office. The first one, which is just how many teams have we sent from California? What's the process that they go through to get there? Well, currently we've actually deployed eight of our urban search and rescue task forces. We actually have eight uh, what we call state national. These are these are teams that uh, are uh, sponsored by local government fire agencies and are part of the state system, but also are part of the national system uh, under the urban search and rescue program. And all eight of those uh, teams have been deployed to Texas. And the teams that have been deployed, uh, some have deployed as what we call full uh, urban search and rescue teams, uh, which uh, includes all of the heavy structural rescue capabilities, uh, the engineering, the medical, this multifunctional capability, uh, and then uh, about four of those. And then uh, four other four have, have deployed uh, as a smaller component focused on doing swift water and flood rescue. All of the teams come with a swift water and flood rescue component. Um, these are multifunctional teams designed to deal with pretty much any kind of disaster the country may face. Um, uh, but there's a smaller component that we bring that are a little bit lighter on their feet and they can go in and, and deploy rapidly into some of these areas to focus on water rescues. And you talk about the teams going in, they're actually coming with their own small boats that once they get there, they're self-efficient, correct? They are. They're completely self-contained. They, they, they not only have the necessary rescue equipment, but they've got uh, a couple of different kinds of boats. They have inflatable rescue boats, and then they've got uh, flat uh, aluminum rescue boats that are designed to go over debris and other kinds of right. things in floodwaters. And, um, and, and uh, they're, they're all self-sustained for uh, a number of days. They go out and they don't need a lot of outside logistics support initially. Um, they're really gonna hit the ground running and begin to do, do search and rescue almost immediately. What other events have you gotten a call for or has California gotten called to send our USAR teams out for? We, we have had, um, well, the program was started here in California back in the late 80s and early 90s. And, and since then, these, these specialized teams have responded literally all over the world. I mean, they have been uh, domestically here to a number of hurricanes, including Hurricane Katrina, which is probably the, the best known. Right. Um, in addition, uh, they've responded to um, uh, the World Trade Center, terrorism events, the Oklahoma City uh, bombing, and, um, and of course the Northridge earthquake here in California. And we've had a number of flood scenarios occur here in California, 97, 95 floods. And most recently, this past winter, we deployed uh, the swift water rescue components of these task forces out throughout California when we were dealing with a number of pretty significant flooding here in California. Uh, internationally, they've been to um, Nepal earthquake and the Haiti earthquake, um, and uh, they've been to the Philippines. So they, they've moved around the, the world quite a bit as well. You touched on their training. I had a chance to go out with them a couple of days a few months ago, just for a couple of days on the American River and watch their training. But that was just for two days. Can you talk about the broad spectrum of training that they go through to, so that they can be prepared for what they're going into now? Yeah, these are probably our highest uh, trained what we call special operations uh, focused teams. They go through um, um, a variety of different kinds of scenario trainings, everything from structural collapse as a result of really any kind of condition, whether it's, it's wind-driven structural collapse or an earthquake or um, something like a terrorist action like we saw at the World Trade Center where you actually bring a building down. Um, they do a lot of uh, uh, training in technical search operations, being able to locate people who may be trapped under rubble, um, uh, using very high-tech devices and other kinds of search techniques to be able to locate where these victims are. Uh, the use of heavy machinery and heavy tools to be able to cut through things like heavy concrete and rebar and other kinds of materials. 
Uh, in fact, there's really not, not really any kind of material that these, these teams cannot really deal with to be able to go in and, and rescue people. They also have an engineering component. They're taught uh, components of structural engineering, how do buildings um, basically react to wind or earthquake or bombing blast types of situation. Uh, they have a medical component uh, where they, they be able to, they're able to do what's called uh, USAR medicine or special uh, uh, collapse medicine where you've got individuals who may be trapped. You have to treat them while they're still in a trap situation right. to be able to get them out. They also have hazardous materials training and uh, they have uh, the ability to uh, deal with chemical, biological, nuclear, and radiological kind of events that may take place. Uh, and of course, they have the swift water and flood rescue uh, training to deal with uh, flooding conditions and, and fast water uh, situations. So they're, they're very multifunctional uh, and, and can be utilized on a number of different kinds of disasters. We want to understand and respect the gravity of what's happening in Texas, but I think it's natural for Californians to say, are we still protected should something happen in the next couple of weeks here? Can you talk to that extent? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, you have to remember California, obviously largest state in the country, and, and we are extremely resource rich here. Uh, even though we have a lot of disasters in California, which many you know of us watch on the news all the time, right. we're constantly responding to those. Our job here at the Office of Emergency Services is to constantly manage uh, resources and what we call drawdown. We look at all of the events that are currently taking place within the state, across the country, and around the world. Uh, we look at what requests are made for uh, to us from other locations, and we're constantly balancing um, the number of resources available to the needs that, that there are. Um, we still have a lot of resources in California. We've uh, deployed these teams, but we also have, uh, beyond the eight federal, state federal teams, I have another uh, 13 urban search and rescue teams that are uh, uh, throughout the state of California tied in with other local entities that we can still call upon. So we are still pretty covered and we at OES would never uh, allow uh, the, uh, the drawdown so much that we uh, put ourselves in jeopardy. So it's, it's, a, it's a big balancing act, but we still have a few resources that we certainly can commit and support the folks in Texas and wherever else the storm may be going. Along those lines, do you anticipate sending more or getting the request to send more at this point? Well, actually, we're in conversations now with regards to the potential for sending additional resources. Um, this is a truly catastrophic situation going on in the Gulf Coast. Um, you know, uh, uh, really this is a situation where it, where it is all hands on deck. And uh, in this effort of one team, one fight as a national system, a national mutual aid system, um, it's really our responsibility to support our other states when they've got these kinds of events as they would support us if we were to have a major earthquake or another kind of event here. You talk about your inconstant communications. Can you describe in any detail what's happening every day between Texas and not only California, but any other states that could be sending mutual aid? Well, there's a, there's a, a, a lot of coordination happening at different levels. Right. You know, certainly Texas itself has its hands full of dealing with what's right in front of them. They're responding to the immediate needs. Um, above them, you know, you have this coordination that's taking place at a national level because there are so many national entities that are in, engaged and there are a number of states. FEMA, uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, plays a critical role in that and, and they're uh, in th constant conversation with us with regards to what other additional resources, maybe they're specialized, not just swift water and flood rescue. Uh, maybe they would need structural engineers or maybe they would need uh, specialists in recovery operations or emergency sheltering. Um, we have a wide variety of capabilities in California given just the fact that we are so disaster prone, we've got a lot of capability here that we could provide them a lot of um, resources as necessary. So that coordination of communications happens between the state of Texas and, and, and us, and it also happens between us and FEMA on a larger, broader basis. And final question, the deployment, a lot of people don't understand, how long of a time period are we talking about our resources being sent there at one time? Well, each individual task force typically goes out for a 14 to 21 day commitment. And, um, you know, this is, a, this is a situation that is not gonna go away anytime soon. So we're gonna, we're in it for the long haul to support uh, the state of Texas or any other state. Um, it may mean that we need to rotate personnel, uh, but um, as long as we're needed, um, California will be committed to supporting uh, this particular incident. Prepar you prepare all year long for something like this to happen and then you send the guys out there and tell them to go do your thing. Well, I mean, 
um, like I say, you know, California, we have enough events where we keep them pretty busy, but you're right. I mean, these are um, one of the special forces of the fire service right. and um, they are trained to deal with these kinds of events and uh, couldn't be more proud of them. They're going out the door to do what they do best and, and they've done in the past and I, I think they'll do a good job and we'll continue to augment them as necessary um, with, uh, with additional resources or any specialized requests that we can support with. Mark, thank you for your time. Happy to do it. If you'd like more information on the California USAR teams that are in Texas, you can always find more on our website. That is oesnews.com. For all of us at Cal OES News, I'm Brian May.